Good morning and good afternoon, depending wherever you are in the world. I'm, I'm very pleased to join you today to present the opportunities in the Middle East alongside my UK export finance colleagues, Michelle Leong and David Moleshead. As Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner for the Middle East, Afghanistan and Pakistan, it's my role to drive trade and investment between the UK and this dynamic region, creating jobs and growth in the UK, as well as driving prosperity in our home nations. International trade is vital to drive growth for the United Kingdom's economy. COVID-19 has shown us the importance of keeping trade flowing and building diverse and robust supply chains. New free trade agreements are an important part of the long-term economic recovery, providing new opportunities for businesses and entrepreneurs in every industry. We are also working to break down market access barriers in international markets for UK companies. But global economic growth is under pressure. Despite the IMF forecasting a less severe recession this month than it predicted in June, the global economy is still in deep recession and the risk of a worse outcome than in its new forecast is still sizable. Global growth is projected at minus 4.4% in 2020. And in the Middle East region, real GDP is projected to fall by 4.1%. For Britain, the latest forecasts now predict that the UK economy will decline by 11.3% this year. The June forecast was 10.2%. This means that the support that DIT gives to exporters is more important than ever. The region I cover as HM Trade Commissioner is diverse, with the wealthy oil export nations, typically in the Gulf, to frontier markets like Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan. But due to the limited time today, I will focus mostly on the markets of the Gulf. UK trade with the Middle East is significant, particularly trade with the Gulf markets. Total trade in goods and services between the UK and the GCC was 40.9 billion at the end of Q2 this year. Outside of the European Union, the Gulf taken as a block is the UK's second largest export destination globally, behind the US and China only. Within the GCC, the United Arab Emirates is our largest trading partner, accounting for 43% of all trade. Buyers in the region are willing to pay more for UK-made products. In fact, 48% of UAE respondents to a Barclays Bank survey on the perception of Brand UK said they would pay more for goods made in the United Kingdom because they perceive the quality to be higher, to be more reliable and internationally respected, and most importantly, good value for money. However, the impact of COVID and the resulting drop in oil prices will have lasting repercussions. Oil exporting countries were hit hardest by the double whammy of the pandemic and the resulting decline in oil demand and oil prices. Those countries which are also tourist destinations, such as the UAE and Bahrain, were further impacted by the drop in visitor numbers. Countries are beginning to reopen, however, albeit somewhat cautiously. It's clear that the region's immediate response to the pandemic, including lockdowns, increased focus on healthcare provision and PPE supply, massive testing programs and fiscal stimulus packages have come at an economic price. This has meant that budgets across all markets have been cut and government focus turned towards the sectors of most importance in the wake of the pandemic. But there remain opportunities in the Gulf despite COVID. Sector opportunities are driven by Gulf vision strategies. Priority sectors have shifted with COVID but what has not changed is the focus on technology to deliver their vision strategies. Priorities include education, 
healthcare and life sciences, smart cities, including energy and infrastructure, food and drink, including agritech, to, to name but a few. In education, edtech is key because of the increase in distance learning, which is likely to be a remaining factor. Vision strategies include healthcare as a priority. The COVID pandemic has increased the urgency of this area. Energy and infrastructure and smart cities are also part of Gulf vision strategies. These are front and center in Saudi Arabia, for example, through its giga projects such as Neon, Qadir, and the Red Sea development. In the UAE, it has Expo 2020 in Dubai. And in Qatar, there is the World Cup, the FIFA World Cup in 2022, where clean energy objectives meet smart city ambitions. COVID's impact on the oil price means that there is increasing pressure to diversify away from hydrocarbons. Solar PV is already picking up pace and the region already holds the record, the lowest solar PV cost in the world. Food security has been an increasingly important sector in the Gulf and there is increased focus on domestic capacity to grow food supplies. You are here because you are interested in winning business in the Middle East. My department within the Department of International Trade have advisors in 12 markets across the Middle East, plus our regional UK export finance team in Dubai and your local export finance managers in the UK are all here to help you do that. Thank you very much for listening to me this morning and I'll now hand over to my regional colleagues in UK export finance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, for your very insightful overview of the Demiak region. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am David Molsed, Senior Councillor, uh, UK Export Finance, and together with my colleague Michel Leon, we are based in the region and are responsible for originating UK export finance transaction across the Demiak region, which is the Middle East less Egypt plus Afghanistan and Pakistan, but in fact, most of our activities are focused on the GCC markets. Both Michelle and I are former bankers, as indeed is Simon, the trade commissioner that you've just heard from. Between Michelle and, and myself, we have lived and worked in the region for over 30 years. So we are accustomed to seeing changes in which is still a very fast growing region, offering a range of opportunities despite the impact of COVID and the dramatic fall in oil prices. Yes, there have been cutbacks in capital expenditure plans across the GCC, but by comparison to many other parts of the world, these reduced plans are still very significant indeed. Where we are experiencing a change of approach is in the attitude of using UK export finance. Certain sponsors have admitted to us that it had been their intention to fully fund multi-billion dollar projects with equity only. Now that they see interest rates at an all-time low, they want to take advantage of this position from agencies such as UK Export Finance, whilst at the same, same time squeezing the margins for the contracts awarded. My colleague Michel will take you through some slides which will provide an overview of the project activity in the key markets, highlight the amount of market risk appetite that's available and then give details of some of the projects that UKF has supported in the recent past. Over to you, Michelle. So thank you, David. Um, the activities of the Middle East region can best be described by this slide, uh, which shows the value of contracts awarded to individual countries over the last five years and up to the first half of 2020. Over the last um, couple of years, the majority of the contracts awarded and executed in the Middle East regions are related to um, or concentrated to the two largest economies in the UAE and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. UAE once had the highest value of contracts awarded, but following the slowdown in the construction sector since last year, the collapse of oil price, uh, the current impact of COVID, UAE, especially um, Dubai, is in consolidation phase now. Uh, although we expect a pickup of sizable activities in Abu Dhabi to spur the UAE economy moving forward. Interestingly, there is a steady increase of contracts awarded in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and by first half of this year, um, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has overtaken UAE and the rest of the countries in the Middle East. 
Even in challenging times with various lockdown measures, projects continue to be awarded and executed, such as the Red Sea and Kadia, and we expect more to come to the market, especially the PPP projects. We expect the pace of growth to increase, given the Kingdom's ambitious vision 2030, and certainly UK export finance would be very much like to be part of the Kingdom's growth engine. Now, the next slide shows contracts awarded by sector. Despite the slowdown in the construction sector, is, uh, the construction sector is still very much an important sector to the Middle East economy. With the minimum UK content, searching for and financing projects, projects that have a positive impact to the environment, such as those with low carbon emission, energy efficient, pollution prevention and control, and etc., will be the forefront of UK export finance activities in 2020 and 2021. And henceforth, construction on green buildings, clean energy, such as renewables, wastewater treatment, clean transportation, like taking diesel vehicles off the roads, and projects uh, which reduce harmful emission to the environment could potentially qualify for a UK export finance clean growth direct lending port, uh, provided there is a minimum UK content in these projects. In addition to these sectors, the priority sectors for UK export finance would be healthcare and education, where UK has a very strong and established supply chain and technology. And why technology? And that's because UK is the third largest technology hub in the world after US and China. Now, both of these countries have large domestic consumption and hence they are self-sustainable within their markets compared with UK, which has a smaller domestic market and very different demographic. Hence, UK technology companies have to export. If you look at the Middle East region, up to 60 to 70 percent of its population are below the age of 35, who are keen to adapt uh, the new technology. And also the region is looking to build smart cities. And this is where we believe that UK could play a role. Now, this slide shows that um, over the last two financial years, from 2018 to March 2020, more, most, uh, above, more than 60% of the transactions underwritten by UK export finance globally relates to new transactions in the Middle East. In such challenging times, um, ECA such as UK export finance has been tasked to step up our support to fill the liquidity gap in the market, often vacated by the private financial institutions, which find it difficult to fund uh, in particular long-term projects. As of September this year, I'm pleased to announce that UK export finance has increased our market risk appetite in over 100 countries. This slide shows UK export finance market risk appetite for the GCC and non-GCC markets. As you can see, UK export finance has ample market risk appetite to finance commercially viable businesses in the GCC markets. Markets in GCC regions such as Dubai, UAE, Abu Dhabi, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, our market risk appetite is in excess of £4 billion each. For the non-GCC markets, we are more active in Iraq and to a lesser extent in Jordan, um, though we are starting to see a spur of activities uh, from Pakistan. Um, this slide shows some of the most uh, recent notable projects financed by UK Export Finance in the Middle East. In the UAE, we provided £220 million worth of support uh, to support the UK contractor Kia for the construction of the 17,000-seater state-of-the-art Dubai Coca-Cola Arena, where there were 167 UK supply chain contracts. Um, the construction of the waste to energy company Bihar headquarters in Sharjah using recycled materials was financed by UK Export Finance. UK content, amongst others, covered the architecture fees by the late Zaha Hadid and the purchase of artificial intelligence from Johnson Controls. All the four phases of uh, Dubai World Trade Center were financed by UK Export Finance. Construction of the fourth phase of Dubai, um, the World Trade Center was by the UAE Al Shafa Group ASGC. Um, in Oman, we supported IHG contracts for the construction of the three hospitals. In Bahrain, we provided our direct lending facility to the UK company Blue Water Bio for their contract to upgrade the wastewater treatment plant in Tupli. Um, UK Export Finance has also provided our cover and direct lending to finance the power infrastructure projects in Iraq. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I'll now pass it to uh, my colleague, David. Thank you, Michelle. I would now like to take you through some features which apply to financing projects in the GCC region. First of all, the acceptability of UK export finance. As Michelle has shown, 
UKF has a good track record of providing UKF support in the UE, Oman, Gata and Bahrain. So it's well regarded and understood by buyers, borrowers, contractors and banks. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is now getting engaged in using ECA finance as it wants to bring international, hopefully UK, expertise and also because of the size of their plans alongside additional sources of finance. Other sources of finance that should be noted that, however, that many of the GCC sovereigns have very good access to capital. Firstly, from their own reserves and sovereign wealth funds, which have historically benefited from oil revenues. Also from their reputation in the international capital markets. Since COVID, all the GCC countries except uh, Kuwait have tapped into the capital markets. This has been more challenging for Oman and Bahrain, but the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, UAE and Qatar have been able to raise debt issues which have been substantially oversubscribed. It was also interesting to see that they have obtained tenors of 30, 40 and 50 years unheard of previously in the capital markets in the Middle East. Also in markets like Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, banks which are, banks are pretty liquid and a bit of, with a bit of persuasion from above are able to offer long tenors at attractive pricing. What prompts buyers to take UK export finance? Well, first of all, the process of procurement and finance are not linked in quite the same way we see in other markets. The procurement team will look at contracts from a technical and commercial basis and sometimes take into account the in-country value and take no heed of the financing potentially available alongside the UK, the UK source contract. It's only when the Treasury team steps in sometimes months later after the contracts have been let do they consider the financing retrospectively. This can be supported on a reimbursement basis by UK Export Finance, but it has challenges because the values being sought then are usually in the hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions. The credit risk is not the problem, it's being able to undertake the necessary due diligence to put the facilities in place as quickly as the borrowers would like. It is unlikely they will look at small values for UKF financing on a standalone basis, and by this I mean below tens of millions. However, these can be accommodated if they're included as part of a JV arrangement or as a dedicated subcontractor. Our preference is for the loans to take place before construction and or supplies are entered into, and this allows exporters to benefit from certainty of payment during the contractual process. So what are the recent trends? Those buyers and sponsors that have, had ex have access to the capital markets are very conscious of their ratings and the effects of any downward movement impacting the cost of future funding. So there are definite moves to take the projects off balance sheet and PPPs are very much the order of the day. PPPs have been used very successfully in the oil and gas and the power sector where there is no demand, but some of the other sectors now being considered could be more challenging, especially if governments are looking to reduce their level of support underpinning these projects. So how does UKF compare to other agencies? First of all, we are seen to be more flexible than other agencies. UK Export Finance was one of the first agencies to support an IPP project in the region. And as it happens, I was involved in the arrangement of this in 1995 in Oman. We were the first ECA to undertake the first Islamic capital market transaction in the same deal, which was to cover the delivery of Airbus 380s to Emirates. We were the first ECA to complete a transaction in Dubai after the previous financial crisis. The fact that we are 20% UK content eligible for UK support puts us well ahead of many other ECAs who require 50% and above national content. Of course, as you have heard before, Michelle, the clean growth renewable energy direct lending facility at very attractive fixed rates is well regarded by sponsors. Gives us confidence that this will give UK exporters an additional edge. Does the lead contractor need to be a UK company? Again, this puts us ahead of other agencies who restrict their support to their own national champions. In the recent past, UKF, UKF has supported contracts by companies such as GE, Siemens, and Technique. These, of course, are not UK groups, but they either have the footprint or the ability to source UK, UK content. 
We've gone even further as one of the most active users of UK financing is ASGC, a Dubai-based contractor, who we have supported with transactions in Dubai and Angola. In summary, we are confident that you will be able to, to support you in the immediate future. There's a multitude of opportunities in high value projects. There are many credit worthy sponsors that we're happy to, to assume a risk upon. And as you'll see earlier, we have significant amounts of market risk appetite and some very good attractive products. We look forward to supporting you to win business in our markets. Thank you, and we're now ready to answer any questions.